Good afternoon and welcome to the second concurrent session of the day, the innovative moment, how to start using mindful writing in the classroom. Our presenter today is Alexandria Perry, MFA, PhD, and New Hampshire Poet Laureate. Alexandria serves as New Hampshire Poet Laureate and is a 2020 recipient of an Academy of American Poets Laureate Fellowship in support of her mindful writing workshops for survivors of her state's opioid crisis. Alex maintains a dual career in creative writing and composition rhetoric and specializes in mindful writing, the topic of her 2019 TEDx talk, How Mindfulness Can Transform the Way You Write, and Prolific Moment, Theory and Practice of Mindfulness for Writing. She was the architect and host of the popular National Council of Teachers of English Mindful Writing Webinar, which had two shows during the fall of 2020 and the winter of 2021. Alex is the author of seven books, including Control, Bird, Alt, Delete, and Creative Writing Pedagogy for the 21st Century. She is a professor in the English department at Salem State University. Please join her on Twitter at Write Mindfully. If you have any questions for the presenter during the session, please feel free to enter those into the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom meeting screen, and we will address them at the end of our time. On that note, I'm excited to hand it on over to our presenter. Thank you, Megan. And thank you, Hawks Learning, for sponsoring this event and for people for being here. I wish I could see your faces, but this is great too, I guess. So, um, so yeah, thank you for being here. I just want to tell you what we're up to today. So the key concern on our mind is what would be different about our writing experiences and the experiences of our students if we paid more attention to the present moment as we wrote or as they wrote. And so in this presentation, I'll be providing some key tenets of the mindful writing, writing pedagogy and theory, some ways to implement them in your classrooms, and also try to give you a brief hands-on experience in our time together. So I'm going to say, um, to answer my own question at the beginning, what happens if we add present awareness to our, our students' writing experience that there's a whole lot that happens, a seismically different writing experience is possible. The stakes are um, very high, and here's why. Most people have a lifelong lack of confidence about their writing. It doesn't matter what walk of life the person is from. Um, most, most people just feel not necessarily adequate um, or happy about their own writing or even happy to be writing, right? And uh, the problem with this is that mindlessness, the way in which we routinely teach writing is a mindless way. Uh, what happens is that people lug around that mindlessness for the rest of their lives. So the stakes are really, really high. Um, so let's get to some definitions first. Um, so first off, what's mindfulness? So a good definition of mindfulness, pretty conventional one, is that it's the detached, non-judgmental awareness of the ever-changing present moment. The detached, non-judgmental awareness of that ever-changing present moment. So what's really important about what we're going to talk about today in our time together is watching arising mental formations thoughts, feelings, etc., that clutter the present moment, specifically as concerns writing, okay? So what's mindlessness? Um, sad to say that uh, this mindlessness, which is ignoring, overlooking the present reality, is actually our human default position. Um, we mindlessly talk, gesture, <laughs> mindlessly sit in our chairs, mindlessly eat, uh, mindlessly check our cell phones, mindlessly teach, mindlessly drive cars, brush our teeth, and no surprise, we also mindlessly write. Mm. So the human attention span has been clocked in at between eight and 12 seconds, the attention span 
to the present moment. So we really need a lot of help. And what I want to say to stay present, what I want to say about this too is that writing actually and how writing is taught in schools, I think exasperates human mindlessness because we're often telling people to think about the future, their readers, the outcomes, you know, products, etc. And that's a problem. And then on top of that, writing is such a ubiquitous human activity for the whole of a person's life, right? That they're gonna have plenty of opportunity then, so to speak, to be mindless. So um, again, it's really, really important. So it's reinforced by traditional writing education and some of the obstacles that the theorist Ellen Langer has written about, about mindlessness. She says in general, about learning in general, not specific to writing, but learning in general. She says that um, by ignoring the present moment, we fixate on outcome. There's rote learning that happens. Um, there's a real mistaken belief in limited resources or potential. And again, I'm gonna say, Langer wasn't talking about writing, but all of that really happens when our students write in even a more pronounced way. Um, there's so many future-based stressors when it comes to writing that um, mindfulness is important. So, but the good news, here's the good news, that even with a few basic, minimal, brief um, changes in how we teach so that we do a little mindful writing activity with our students, we can make big difference almost immediately. So that's really the good news. We can start to undo 10, 15, 20 longer years of habits just with a few starting strategies. So, and also I wanna say the other good news is that these techniques, they can be used um, in writing classes, you know, composition classes, uh, creative writing, but also across the curriculum. So in any course that you're teaching, it doesn't have to be a writing class. So what's mindful writing? Okay, it doesn't mean meditating, although often watching the breathing is part of it. So it doesn't mean meditating in the classroom, all right? So Mindful writing is actually like a lot of other activities in the mindfulness tradition. They don't just sit on a cushion and have incense spiraling around them and, and that's where they're mindful. They try to be mindful practitioners of it um, in their everyday life. So there's mindful eating, mindful walking, mindful listening, mindful speech. And so mindful writing is just one of those activities off the cushion. So what's mindful writing? Okay. It's the non-judgmental, non-judgmental, you can already tell why that might be important for people writing, right, students, non-judgmental focus on the present as we write. And when we do that, we gain access to some really powerful resources. I'm going to walk us through them, but then I'm going to afterwards slow down and talk about a few of these and how to implement them in your classrooms. So the first thing we gain access to, the first tool that comes to the foreground with present awareness that's not conventionally talked about in school settings is that we gain access to our inner self-talk, our, our intrapersonal rhetoric. We in classes teach interpersonal rhetoric, so using language to influence other people, but intra, language that we're using on ourselves to influence ourselves is happening all the time, all around us. So mindful writing helps us gain access, helps our students gain access to this intrapersonal rhetoric, which is great for nonstop content. There's always material to write about. It helps us, when we start noticing it, better manage our preconceptions um, about our writing ability, task specific or in general. Um, we manage better our storylines, the stories we tell ourselves about our writing, and probably, maybe most importantly, we gain perspective on tricky audiences. We see that we have a wonderful privacy. Our students have a privacy, actually, in the writing moment. There are really no readers or critics in sight. So that's the first one. First one is, with mindful writing, you gain access, and you help your students gain access to internal rhetoric. So the second thing, is that you gain access to impermanence, constant change. So everything in the world is changing, including writing, which is really wonderful. Uh, as I tell my students, change is the writer's number one asset. It's not something to be afraid of. 
Um, the reason why is that nothing is static. So writing ability and inability, it's not static. You have a bad moment with your writing. And if you watch with mindfulness very patiently, quickly, by the way, it turns to a good moment. But then conversely, a good moment is going to change to a bad. You just, you watch it. And there's that faith that things are going to keep changing. And along that line, so there's no static bad writer or static good writer. It's much more fluent, right? Along that line too, impermanence helps us be more, rest more easily with blank moments, moments where there's nothing on our screen or page without panicking. Um, a lot of students panic when they have to start something or they don't know quite what to say yet. Um, it helps us with that. And that's because form and formlessness in a Buddhist sense are intertwined. So no writing is actually very closely intertwined with writing. And then the last one is embodiment. So a mindfulness perspective is great because it lets us tap into our whole selves as we write our students to their bodies. It honors their whole selves um, as writers. Very, very important. Okay, so structural points for pedagogy here. We're gonna cover some noticing to be present activities for the classroom, but what you should know about this, we don't, you know, we don't have a lots and lots of time, but trust me on this, okay? So the first thing is that these can be used again in any course across the curriculum. So it could be in a writing class, but it could also be in a biology class. It could be anything, right? Um, so the other thing you should know is that it can be used, these techniques, at any stage in the writing process. We won't have time to talk about that, but you can use it for invention, beginning to write. Um, you can use it for revision, feedback, finishing documents, anything like that. So all of these phases of writing. And uh, lastly, um, as I said at the beginning, even one time doing this can help people, right? So it can be a one-time exercise, something brief. Or you can actually, as I do, um, have a full length writing project or essay based on one of these. Um, so, okay, so let's get started. I'm gonna go through four of those tenets right now of the pedagogy and give you hands-on um, strategies to use in your classroom. Okay, and we're gonna have practice time, which is the best part. All right, so the first noticing activity, first noticing activity is going back to that internal rhetoric. Remember I was just saying that intrapersonal rhetoric, the self talking to the self, right? So this is really important because helping students first perceive that internal rhetoric and then monitor it for its impact is the baseline activity for all mindful writing. So you'll hear as we go through some of the other parts, you'll hear me reference this because it's really like the, the baseline, the fundamental act, noticing that self-talk. Um, so again, what is that self-talk? So we can call it intrapersonal rhetoric, um, internal rhetoric. Uh, Buddhists have a great phrase for it I really love, which is monkey mind. It's great, huh? So monkey mind, you know, monkey jumping all over the place. Um, so it's, I would also say it's this invisible, often we're mindlessly susceptible to it, but we don't see it, ongoing river of words and language that's inside each of us. It's happening in me right now and it's happening in you right now. So that's the, the monkey mind, the internal rhetoric. So as teachers, you wanna think about how to engage students with this part. And there are a couple of decisions I think that are pretty important. The first is you really want to make sure that you give your students a lot of opportunity for low stakes writing with this. What, what does that mean? It means um, nothing that's heavily graded, maybe not even graded at all, to give them an opportunity, a safety zone to do this kind of work. Okay. And the other thing is I'm a big fan of this part. Big fan. I couldn't teach without it, I don't think. Mm -mm. It's private writing. So that's writing that they don't share with you or with anybody. And at the extreme disposable writing where they're destroying it afterwards and they don't even retain it. It's so impermanent in a good way that they don't retain it. So low stakes and privacy are really gonna be important with helping students get this baseline internal rhetoric awareness going. So what we're doing is with this, 
We're tracking language as it arises in the moment. Really important here, without prematurely judging it, evaluating it, or fixing it. So it's non judgmental. Remember that definition of mindfulness? And it's detached. So without prematurely evaluating, fixing, organizing anything, you're just watching it. And um, again, you, it's really important because having students do this is going to make them more mindfully aware of other deterrents that often cause stress in writing, like tricky readers and preconceptions. And you really want to make sure that it's, you're letting them have a sense of safety around this, um, this part. So. The best tool for tracking internal rhetoric by far is mindful free writing. And I'm sure that if I could see your faces, I'm pretty sure a lot of us know free writing, right? So free writing is, you know, it's, it happens all the time in classes, right? So free writing is that non-stop writing. Peter Elbow talks about it a lot. You know, that non-stop writing, you don't go back to fix. Does that sound familiar? You're just tracking, right? It could be to a prompt or it could be open. It could be shared or private. Um, so free writing inherently is one of the best ways to capture monkey mind because and here, okay, so I'm a little biased. Here's why mindful writing might be a little better than sitting on the cushion. You're on the cushion, right? These things go by and you are noticing them with detachment. They go by, but with writing, you're actually writing it down and it's more visible. And so you can really see what that monkey mind is up to because she's got it on the page. She's kind of caught him in a cage called free writing. Okay, so what's mindful free writing? So free writing is that nonstop to a prompt, right? Shared or not shared. Mindful free, free writing combines breath, watching the inhalation and the exhalation while writing. It could become the topic of a free write, which I highly recommend having students actually free write about breathing <laughs> privately, obviously not graded. I wouldn't grade that one. So breathing, um, but matching the act of free writing while trying to draw attention to breathing. Very, very powerful. Okay. So I think it's a little weird because I can't see your faces, but we're going to try something here for a second. Um, two parts with this. Why don't we try a mindful free write just for, I mean, I would do this longer if we had a longer time, but just for what we have, we're going to do this for about a minute. Okay. And I got a topic for you. Let me set my timer here. <clears throat> got it. Okay. We're going to do this for about a minute. And um, what I'm gonna ask you to do is, you have paper, I hope, right? A pen nearby. Could you please free write to the following privately? What's going on in me right now? Right now, what's going on? Keep asking yourself that, but how am I doing right now? How am I doing right now? And as you're free writing, knowing you're not going to share this or put it in the chat function afterwards, okay? Could you please also watch your breathing? Could you please also watch your breathing? Okay, so let's go for a minute here.
Okay, so you had a little mini experience of it, right? So I'm gonna walk you through another thing. Um, by the way, at the very end, I'm gonna have a little screen that will have resources and where you can find actually how to do this stuff, okay? So um, there'll be a little, there'll be links to it. So the next one I wanna say is the a mind list activity. So what's a mind list? And I'm just gonna run through it. We don't have time to do it, but it's this. Have students watch their breathing inhalation, exhalation, and then ask them to do the following. When their mind is no longer on the physical sensations of breathing, which is bound to happen, they should ask themselves, all right, what am I, if I'm not watching my breathing, what am I doing? And it's gonna fall into three categories. If they're thinking about the future, like what's happening after class or, tomorrow or next week or this summer, they should write the letter F or F-U-T, which my students like because it sounds like something else, but F-U-T, okay? And then put the pen down without judging themselves and go back to watching their breathing. However, <laughs> if they find themselves not watching their breathing, but instead they are thinking about the past, like before the class, five years ago, last month, anything to do with the past, they should write P-A-S or P on their list drop the pen without judging themselves, without recording also what the mental formation is, and go back to watching the breathing. Then lastly, if they find themselves, as they will, judging something, sorting things into good, bad, and different, right? They should write eval or E on their list, and then put the pen down again and go back to watching the breathing. And so what happens with the mind list activity is you'll hear pens, you'll hear the pens clicking like this, right? Yourself included, myself for sure too. And then afterwards, I'll say, okay, don't tell us what you were, what your mental formations were. Just could somebody read us the list? And I always model it myself. I'll read my list. Mine, because I'm the presenter, the teacher will have a lot of eval judging myself and probably futz thinking about the future, right? The next minute. And so you'll hear all these crazy lists. Um, and I'll say to them, okay, you all put something down, right? So therefore, I'm going to say you all had an experience, a firsthand experience with mindfulness. Because sometimes students say, I don't know what you mean, Professor Perry, about mindfulness. What's this present aware? You say you're, it's hard to be here, but we're all in class together. We're all looking at each other. No, we're actually not. We're pretty mindless. Um, in fact, I'm going to tell you right now that today, right the second, is probably the first time I'm actually present even though I've been with you for 15 minutes, I'm really present right now. So anyway, I tell them, hey, if you put anything down on that list, you were mindful. And what I'm trying to get them to do when we talk about in conversation is, you were mindful because you perceived your arising mental formations. They didn't kidnap you and take you away into the future past or judgments, right? You thought, hey, I'm monkey mind. I'm thinking about the future past or I'm evaluating and you recorded it, and then you went back without criticizing yourself to watching your breathing. So you were actually firsthand mindful. Okay, so that's an activity, a brief activity. It doesn't yield writing that ever should be graded or tied to a project, but it actually helps them use writing to capture a picture of their monkey mind. All right, so let's go on to the next point. So the first one was help them develop a baseline awareness that they've got that ongoing river of language. Okay, that was the first one. The second one, help them manage. Well, this is probably, this is for me, this is the most important. Help them manage their internalized audiences. So from a mindfulness perspective for writing, there are no readers. I know that's a contentious thing to say for some people, but literally, they're really, when you write, you're in my writing room right now, thanks to Zoom, my desk is underneath this laptop. This is where I wrote this morning at four, okay, in the morning. I was writing right here. My readers are not physically in the room with me. In fact, above my head right now, I'm going to tilt my screen up. Do you see a little dragon? I'm pointing to a little dragon up there. You see that? That in Buddhist terms is Mara. Mara is a demon who plagued Buddha. And that's my, my, my reader ghost. I keep her right above my head just to remember this, okay? They're from the future. All right, so what do I mean by that? Um, when we write, we frequently act, and our students do this too, as though our reader from the future, for them, us, the teachers, can is in the room, perched on their desk, in their dorms, or their, wherever their, their houses, 
and seeing their document as they write it. And it's very unfair because that reader from the future, well, it's a ghost, they're, they're creating with their own self-talk, but that reader from the future doesn't want their messy free writes, their rough drafts. That reader from the future, because he or she comes from the future, wants the final draft right now, right? But the thing is, it's not fair because the student has had, hadn't had time to write the document, right? So they're really tripped up. And what happens is, person stops, doesn't write very fluently, mixes correcting with creating, is editing, a lot of backspacing, or more defensively towards the self, protectively for the self, they don't write, they procrastinate because they don't wanna be judged. Who wants to be judged all the time? Okay, so it's really important to get our students noticing who they think they're performing for. Are they treating writing like a public speaking experience? I can't stop time and take back words I've said right now. They're coming from my mouth in real time, right? But with writing, you have this wonderful, expansive difference. It's different than public speaking. You gotta make use of the moment. You are separated in space and time from your eventual readers. And um, I wanna tell you uh, one particular incident about this in my classroom and how you can do this with your own students here. Okay, so here's the deal. Sometimes people say, oh, I should say first, okay, what are you trying to do with this? You're trying to have your students figure out who they think they're performing for, and it's gonna be a composite creature it's, it's probably a mix of people, see it and then decide, okay, is it helpful to my writing or not helpful and take mitigating factors, okay? So sometimes people tell me like, how do you actually, these audience ghosts, these reader demons, you know, it's all fine and dandy to have a little poster up there, but what are you talking about really? Do they really exist? I'm gonna prove it, <laughs> okay, here goes. I teach in a classroom that's U-shaped with a teacher at the front, computers at along the U, right? And you can see the students work. You can see them, you see their screens. And I pulled a little experiment. It's my seance to get the ghosts going. Okay, I didn't tell them ahead of time what I was doing, but this is, this is what I did. I told them afterwards the purpose so it didn't mess them up. Okay, ready? I said, okay, free write to this prompt. And I had a prompt on the board and I, I set my clock to make sure I got the time right, right? The exact amount of time for what we're about to do. And I, I said, okay, so, you know, I think I said that's like starting your homework or something. So they're all on their computers and I'm watching them free write. And when I say watch them, I really am. I'm listening to the sound effect of the writing. Is it smooth writing or is it popcorn? Pop, 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 typing, right? And I'm also watching their body language, et cetera. Taking notes, oh, you know, Juan is doing something and Stacy's doing something else with her body language, you know? So I'm taking little notes. Okay, so they, they free write for about three, four or five minutes. Then I go, oh, wait a minute. Sorry guys, I made a mistake. Of course, big act. Um, I made a mistake. Um, here's the prompt. Um, this time we're gonna do a free write again. And then I'm gonna afterwards just randomly poke my hand at the attendance sheet and I'm just gonna, Two of you are gonna read your whole free write to the class, okay? I set my timer, same timer, right? And <laughs> um, they start free writing again, but this time I'm also taking notes on their body language. The first time was pretty fluid, you know? The second time I'm noticing a lot of popcorn noises, pop, 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 typing, right? I'm, looking, I'm hearing sighs, I'm seeing people kind of protectively huddled over their you know, keyboards, Okay, and then afterwards I say, just kidding, not calling on anybody. And I went, this is, a, this is to prove something. I said, can you all add up how many words for that first free write? So we add them all up. And I said, can you all add up all of us, all our words for the second free write, the one in which you think you were gonna share it to the class. And here goes, ready? Got the actual numbers for you. For the first free write, same amount of time, right? Only thinking to themselves it was a private free write they composed a total of 1,390 words, right? For the second free write, in which they thought they were, somebody was gonna be called on like a sacrificial lamb and have to read their entire free write, 744 words were composed, a difference of 47%. And my point is this, that their, the audience ghost was in the room, you know? And it was impacting the quantity they produced 
right? They were the second time they were conflating editing and um, creating. They were correcting because they were scared. They're defensive. They don't want to look bad in front of their peers or their teacher. Um, their body language was so much more stressed out, sound effects, everything. So clearly the reader ghost came in the room and affected their writing. So a brief example, and again, there's going to be links at the end. You can ask them to privately free write um, before starting, continuing, or near the end of a writing task, and any sort of writing task. It could be a small one or a huge project. Um, ask them who they think they're talking to, okay? That's one possibility. I'm also really fond of a, a project called Caricature of a Tricky Audience, and there'll be resources at the end where I actually have them do a verbal caricature, not a drawing like you buy at the mall, but a, a verbal caricature of a tricky audience and then see who's manifesting, okay? So caricature of a tricky audience. And that for me has become, even last week for one of my classes, the seed of an entire paper in a writing class, okay? So, but it can be a small thing too. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next. So we've got that baseline of seeing the internal talk, the next one, um, watching that internal talk manifest into audience ghosts. And then the third one here is perceiving preconceptions. Okay, so what's a preconception? Preconception is a gamble on the next moment. We act as though we think we know what's about to happen, but really we don't. It's kind of a fake way of trying to be in control of chaos, right? But it really forecloses on possibility in life, but also on writing. And so what happens with preconceptions, they cause students to carry around, in general, a massive stone backpack of perfectionism. And it's heavy. <laughs> it's heavy, right? So using that baseline awareness of monkey mind, because again, monkey mind causes tricky readers, but it also causes these preconceptions. We see what they are. So preconceptions can be task specific, like so the paper they're working on, but it could also be in general, oh, I'm not very good at poems, or I'm, I'm really great. It could be a positive preconception. I'm really great at research papers, whatever it's gonna be, right? Task specific, or in general ability. And there are other types, but we don't have time to talk about them. And then also preconceptions cause self pathos. In rhetoric classes, we talk about pathos, the moving of emotions of other people through the words or gestures. Monkey mind, we are actually causing our own emotions. And in our conversation, what we're talking about is our emotions about our writing ability. Okay, so the deal with this is you're trying to watch your preconceptions about your writing ability or the task that you're working on so that you're not kidnapped and taken away into usually negative storylines about the future outcome of your writing. Okay, um, and two more things, mind waves and mind weeds. You wanna watch or help students watch that too. A wave is a little bit hard to teach, but you can do it fleeting sensations about the next moment. It could be body awareness, it's almost nonverbal, flush, heart rate, sweating, whatever it is. And then a mind weed is more of a picture, a preconception. You can pick up a weed like a dandelion, right? It's, it's got some three dimensionality to it, but a mind wave, it's a preconception, but it's nonverbal and just kind of goes through you. You can't pick up a wave. Okay, so recommended activities to help students. Here's a real basic one. Um, a private free write, private mindful free write at the start of class or the beginning, resuming, completing of a writing assignment. Ask them to ask themselves, how have I been talking to myself about this assignment, about my ability, okay? And have them go at it privately, okay? And I'm gonna tell you a few more here. I'm really fond of doing in my own classes what I call a syllabus walk, a syllabus walk. So I say, I have them watch their breath and then I have them jot down um, uncensored whatever their reaction is to what I'm about to say to them, knowing that they don't have to say it to me if they think they're gonna offend me or, okay, they can keep it to themselves. 
And so I'll read various parts of the syllabus to them. I'll say things like, in three weeks, you're going to have a caricature of a difficult audience essay. In two weeks, you'll have your literary journalism project done. Your final exam in this class will be, you know, so I'm basically saying the different upcoming tasks in our class. And they jot down mind waves and mind weeds, preconceptions. Afterwards, I ask them to pick one and follow it. If it were to bloom through mindlessness into a story, a full-blown storyline, and they believed it, how might that storyline affect their writing process, the choices they make about proceeding, their affect, their feelings about writing, and even the outcome? So we try to imagine what would happen if it got carried into the future mindlessly. And another one I find really effective is, good time here, um, build a poem. Okay, so I love this one because the following, most people don't like poetry or they, they love it. They got strong. I know I'm poet laureate of New Hampshire, but I know most people don't, don't like poetry. They have strong feelings about poetry, right? And so here's the deal with this one. Um, I tell students, watch their breathing. And typically, this is not a creative writing class. And I say, watch your breathing. And I'm going to say something to you. And again, privately, jot down whatever it is you're thinking. And I say to them, in a minute, you're going to write a poem. And you can see their faces like, oh, oh yeah. You can see it on their faces, right? <laughs> but um, so that's the deal with that. So you watch their faces and stuff, but they're also taking notes. And so it's like jumpstarting their self-talk, jumpstarting their self-talk, okay? So, and then um, I say, well, okay, just imagine if you let that, whatever you're writing blossom into a mindless storyline, how might it affect, okay, what's about to happen? And then I say, guess what? We are writing a poem for real. It wasn't just an experiment. And I walk them through. I did this even two nights ago with um, some work I do in my state outside of the classroom. I walk them through prompts and I give them prompt to prompt. And then they read a poem within hmm, three, four or five minutes. And it's been remarkable. It happened twice this week at presentations I gave at night in my state. People wrote st stunning poems. <laughs> they wrote stunning things, right? But the thing is that they actually, students will want to share it with the group. And I tell them like, look, hey, you know, when you came to this class today, you had no idea, even 10 minutes ago, you had no idea that this would unfold from you from the next moment. And you had those preconceptions about what a poem might do for you, right? But then look what happened, you know? You never know, every moment, every moment can be a prolific moment. Every moment can be a wonderful surprise. Actually, if we can just be accepting and noticing the impermanence and noticing what arises. All right, so the very last one, very last one here is embodiment. So just to go through that list again, right? So we, we had that baseline watching internal talk. Then I asked you, or we're talking about um, watching, helping students notice how internal talk manifests into an audience ghost. Then I said, let's look at internal talk and see how it manifests in preconceptions about our writing ability, the students' preconceptions about their writing ability. And then the very last one is embodiment. So embodiment, we don't often ask our students to, in writing situations, notice their body as they write, but the, especially breathing, right? So important because there is no better way you know, to be present than to start noticing your breathing. We don't breathe in the past or the future. If you're noticing your breathing, you're doing it here and now. It's almost a instantaneous infusion of mindfulness. So having them watch their breathing has, for instance, it could be other things, which I'm gonna talk about in a second, has instantaneous benefits. It's immediately, soothing first because of the physical effects it lowers the pulse stress hormones all that stuff right but the other thing too is that by watching the breathing we're more here 
and we're less preoccupied with those future oriented thoughts, the ones that really stress us out and stress people out as they write, right? So you're more here, you're more here. And um, what happens with that is that you're actually able to see your thoughts better and mental formations arise and people are able to write them down. So about that, couple activities here. Um, mindful breathing, having them actually describe their breaths mindful free writing, which we talked about earlier. I'm a big fan of yoga for hands, which again, I'll show you the resources at the end, okay? Yoga for hands, uh, I really like doing this one, has students free write about their hands, starting with their fingertips, typing or writing. So the free write, the topic is the physical sensations of writing, and it moves to their fingers, their palms, their wrist, goes up, down, <laughs> goes all the way up to the crown of the head. And what happens is that no matter how stressed out, like I get about my writing or other people get stressed out about their writing, when you do this free write, focusing in on your body combined with the act of writing, because the free write is about yourself writing, it immediately boots out. There's no time to think about stressful audiences or the future. You're actually gonna be here. And I really like yoga for hands as a pre-invention thing. You can have them do it very quickly. Just focus on just the hand, you don't have to do the whole body, but it will be a great technique to get them started or to continue if they've had a break in working on a document. So just to close here, okay, a couple of act things I wanna mention. Um, you know, again, these things can be brief or more sustained. And when I say brief, it could be a, it could be a two, three minute activity you do in class, not graded, getting them to use writing to be more present, or it be, could become a whole project, a whole ex exercise or a whole, ac a whole essay actually, right? Um, the goals again are to help them see their monkey mind, to notice and manage reader ghosts, notice storylines and preconceptions, and then finally try to have them notice their body. So if you can do those four things, you are whew, volumes ahead on the mindful writing. And I gotta say that sequence there, it's not necessarily in that order. You might wanna have people noticing their breathing or their physical state somewhere earlier in that layering. But the baseline really is noticing the, um, the internal talk. So and I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, if you can help your students relax into the writing moment, be here, be now, it's just an amazing experience. You'll, you'll see the difference in your students. I'm, and I know in my own writing life, someone who suffered from a writer's block for a horrible one for years, years, right? Since I have done this approach, um, I write all the time. It's safe to say I'm pretty prolific and writing is my joy. <laughs> it's my complete joy. I love it. It's a state of grace. It's not a punishment or something to dread. It's a great state of grace. So, and I wanna say that what you're gonna be doing if you do this is that you are giving them life skills that they, they'll use for the rest of their lives. It's not just a, a single assignment, you'll be impacting them. So to close, I wanna share something with you and I hope that was useful to you. Um, I do miss seeing your faces, people's faces, but um, I'm gonna share something on the screen, okay? Hopefully not my messy screen. Yeah, my messy screen, that's fun. Okay, do you all see, do you all see a document? Is it there? Okay, is there, is there a document there? Okay, cool, Megan. So um, recommended resources, because I know I said a lot, right? I said a lot, and you're probably thinking like, okay, lady, how am I going to do this, right? So um, three places I would suggest. Um, these are my own works, um, but you can also find the work cited at other people, you know, other people's stuff. So the, I have a TEDx talk, check it out. It's about um, monkey mind and reader demons and how to overcome them and how I overcame them. And then my book has a lot of teaching practices in it. Um, that's where I detail. But also if you don't wanna purchase a book, the blog has quite a few of these things. So yoga for hands or any of the things we mentioned, that's gonna be found on the blog. And then I just wanna say, the, the mantra at the end that I really hope that every moment could be a prolific moment for you and that 
each of your breaths be covered in language and that your writing and your students writing be free of suffering. And thank you for listening to me. So I'm really curious what you have to say. I want to hear. <laughs> so that is wonderful. Thank you so much, Alexandria. I love listening and learning from people that have all this experience and valuable knowledge to share. And if you want to go ahead and you can put the link to that document if you didn't already, and you can put your Twitter handle into the chat so that people can connect with you on Twitter as well. Um, I know that we are out of time, um, but we do have one question that came in and there is also an attendee that raised their hand. If you are that attendee, and can type your question into the Q&A quick, we can try and get to that. Um, but Lori mentioned that students are so grade driven now and sometimes yeah, refuse to do things if they're not receiving credit for it. Do you have any suggestions to combat? Yeah, I'm sure a ton. Um, if you have like a top suggestion for that. Yes, can I say it right now? Yes, yes. Contract grading. I could not live without contract grading. Um, hmm. You can Google this, but Peter Elbow for sure. Uh, contract grading, they do have to do this stuff. They get check, check pluses, check minuses, or just, you know, just they do it. But it's, it's very, there are ways of making this low stakes and having them keep going. For sure. I hear you. Students won't do work if <laughs> they're not, there's not some, right? Contract grading, check it out. It's absolutely wonderful. So. Awesome. Well, that is great. And there's a couple in here about uh, reposting resources, and it looks like it went to just all panelists. So I'll go ahead and put it in the chat so that it gets out to everyone. Um, but you also have a Q&A that says uh, they have incorporated some of your insights into their courses already, and this presentation gave them even more suggestions, and they say thank you. Who is that person, if I may ask? Who is the person? It is uh, Marie-Jean Van Sant. Okay, thank you. That's, that's nice to know. That's yeah, sweet to know. And for all of you with us, thank you again for spending time with us this afternoon. Please be sure to join Nelson Lover, our next keynote speaker, starting soon at 1 p.m. Eastern time. I'm going to go ahead and put the link for that into the chat, as well as some of the links that we've discussed today. If you head to the conference website, don't forget to stop by the exhibit hall and uh, talk with a Hawks representative one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you again from all of us at Hawks for joining today. Thank you, Alexandria, for your time and your knowledge.